I think yesterday was a very interesting day, and today we even have more presentations, and I think it's going to be equally, if not um, more interesting. And to introduce our first panel, I'm going to introduce myself, Hudson Meadwell, who is Interim Dean of the Faculty of Arts, received his BA from the University of Manitoba, his MA and PhD from Duke University. He's known internationally for his work on nations and nationalism, primarily in Europe and North America. He's published extensively in the fields of nationalism studies, comparative and international politics, history, sociology, and social theory. And I can say personally, he's a, been a great Interim Dean. Um, so, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Well, on behalf of the Faculty of Arts, I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to the second day of uh, the signature event uh, at MISC, its annual conference. Uh, the theme this year is Canada on the global stage. Uh, I was able to attend some of the sessions uh, yesterday, and uh, it's, uh, it's going beautifully. Uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to uh, another day of informed discussion. Uh, and this is what MISC does and this conference does uh, for the Faculty of Arts, for McGill, and for the larger community. It provides a, a forum for uh, discussion. Uh, and from the point of view of the Faculty of Arts, this is a very important way in, we, in which the faculty reaches out to uh, the community, uh, uh, Montreal and, uh, uh, and beyond Montreal. Uh, your first panel uh, this morning is going to explore um, some of the issues uh, that arise uh, as new generations enter uh, onto the global stage. The first panel will uh, explore what it means to be a young Canadian leader in 2016. And there's no better way to, uh, to think about that uh, than to hear from a group of young panelists who are paving the way for their generation right here at McGill. And it's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the first panel, Professor Colin Moore, a colleague from the Days Hotel Faculty of Management internationally known for his, uh, his work on leadership and strategy, uh, a blogger, uh, a media presence, uh, and, and someone who uh, is uh, uh, w very well placed to, uh, to lead the discussion forward around the issue of uh, leadership uh, and uh, uh, global politics. Carl. All right. Thank you, Hudson, and good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here at MISC. I've admired their work and been involved for a number of years, so uh, great to have you here this morning with us. Um, the idea of this uh, panel came from, I do a radio show interview CEOs uh, for CJD here in Montreal, and we've had uh, Justin Trudeau on, uh, Jeff Molson from the Montreal Canadiens, uh, uh, Melanie Jolly, who's the Minister of Heritage, and so on. But I realized after about 25 shows, I was talking to people largely in their 50s, 60s, and 70s even, where I did a show with three young leaders because it, they're more the future than people my age are. I hope they have a long future, but they have a much longer future, all being well. And so something where it's good for us to think about Canada's future, it's in the hands of people like the three here on the stage. And so we want to focus on their thinking of Canada's place in the world and more broader issues like how is leadership evolving. So let me introduce the three people. So uh, Stephanie here on my left is uh, a BCom grad from 2009. So uh, she then uh, works at Bell and is a strategic analyst there, is doing her part-time MBA as a class president, and does the CEO speaker series with me. And so who's the guest today, Stephanie? We have uh, Sun Life's Isabelle Udon at uh, noon today. So we'll rush over there right after this. So it's an opportunity for the uh, MBA and BCom students to be exposed to senior leaders uh, in Canada and abroad. We've had Richard Branson came one time. Uh, so we've had some people, uh, Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for microcredit. But we have mainly uh, Canadian leaders come and Stephanie does the interviews for that on stage. So Michael Fishman on my right here is from Vancouver. He's a second year, not a communication student. Commerce. He's a B-commerce, a B-com commerce student from Vancouver. He's the president of the Management Undergraduate Society, the MES, which is the main one at the uh, Faculty of Management for undergraduates. So uh, how many undergraduates in business do we have roughly? We have 2,200. So it's quite a big group that we have and very hard program to get into, very, very smart young people and a delight to spend time with them, teach them. I'm taking 30 uh, undergraduates. Two weeks today we'll be in uh, Chilicon Valley, which is in Santiago. So we're spending 11 days in uh, Santiago and Bogota and uh, Cartagena, 
to understand what's going down there. It's called the Hot Cities of the World Tour. So we have a dozen inspiring alumni. Stephanie came as an inspiring alumni to Russia a couple years ago. And um, we, we meet with CEOs, we're meeting with the head of the Bank of Chile Friday afternoon, and then we're going to uh, Chile startup to look at what they're doing down there to replicate the Silicon Valley. And then we're doing a, uh, a dinner Friday night with uh, Miguel alumni in Santiago. So it's an opportunity to see the world and understand. It's called the Hot Cities of the World Tour. And the slogan is taking the future to the future. So if any of you are McGill alumni uh, and semi-inspiring, let me know and we'll see if you can come on next year. Uh, we've been to Israel, the UAE, India, South Africa, Russia, Mongolia and Seoul, and last year Doha, Hong Kong, Jakarta and Bali. And next year we're looking at Rwanda and Kenya. So if anyone's interested, come and see me afterwards. And then Sean Haranza on the end is uh, here from Montreal as well. His uh, father is a faculty member I work with, so it's a delight to, uh, to see uh, Sean has turned out very well indeed. He, mechanical engineering degree from McGill, he did a startup, and he raised over two and a half million dollars from VCs and business angels. Uh, the startup was partly in Seattle, I guess, mm -hmm. and we'll talk a little bit about it later on. Now he's doing his MD, MBA. So, very interesting background and a bit of a shift of careers there. So, great to have Sean with us this morning as well. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of issues and at a certain point we'll turn over to you for your not questions but also comments. So we'd love to hear from particularly the younger members of the audience about how they see the world of Canada unfolding, our place in the world, <clears throat> and what we bring to the world. So those are some of the themes we'll touch on all being well. So just to start, why did you choose to come to university here in Canada rather than go down the States, which is what I did. I grew up in Toronto, but I went to school in LA and Boston. So why did you guys decide to stay in Canada? And we're glad we, you did. Let me first express that thought. So uh, Sean, shall we start with you? Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Montreal, and my dad goes to McGill. So it wasn't really a choice for me for my undergrad. Um, McGill's a fantastic school, and you can get a very good education in the States, but it won't be that much better, at least for the undergrad. He always told me if I wanted to go to the States, I should do that for my graduate degree. And I did apply uh, to some business schools in the States um, for my MBA. And I decided to stay in Montreal because I wanted to go to medical school as well. And McGill is one of the best med schools in the world. Yeah, for myself, I think uh, growing up in Vancouver, you have UBC, which is the natural stay-at-home option. You have McGill, which is if you want to go somewhere else in Canada. And then you have a plethora of amazing universities in the United States. And for me, it really boiled down to the cost. And of course, if I want to go pursue a scholarship, am I dedicating my entire life to athletics. So speaking with my parents about the schools in the States that I was considering, it really boiled down to do I want to spend 30 hours a week playing sports or do I want to be a student first? And I decided to be a student first. If you want to go to university uh, at a reasonable price, you really have to stay in Canada and McGill's the natural option once you've made that decision. What sport do you play? I play water polo. So USC, UCLA, would Stanford, yeah, those Stanford, would be natural yeah, we'll choices. That, yeah. Are you going to play for Canada someday? I have played for Canada, yeah. Hopefully I will continue. Oh, good, okay. Well, Stephanie. So I, I'm a particular case, huge passionate person about McGill because I did my BCom and now I'm doing my MBA there. Um, I chose for my BCom uh, to, to pursue my degree at McGill primarily, yes, for the cost, but McGill is international. It is known as the Harvard of Canada and you do get access to great professors, great education system at, at a very good price. And I, I did question pursuing my MBA, especially because typically you don't do a business degree at the same university. Um, and it, it did take some time for me, two years to make that decision, but I, I am pursuing it part time. So I, I looked at other universities in Canada, and again, I, I did want to stay in Montreal because of Bell Canada, that's where I work. I could have gone to Toronto, but I, I did feel as though McGill was the, the leader of the pack in that sense. And um, in terms of pursuing a, a business degree at the same university, a, a bachelor's and a master's are completely different. It's in terms of your way of learning, your way of contributing, learning from the professors, the students, the environment is completely different. So I, I can't even compare, uh, even though there's some overlap in terms of the courses. And definitely do not regret the opportunities, meeting CEOs, McGill is a, is a leader in Canada, without a doubt. When you look at your career, you've been, you've been down in the States a bit, Sean, but it's been, you know, and you're, 
yeah, Michael, but it's something where you've looked here. Do you see your career taking you outside Canada? Is that something that would be a natural, of course I'll do that, or maybe? Stephanie? Um, I, I do see myself, I was born and raised in Montreal, and I've lived here my whole life, so I definitely see myself seeking that international experience. My whole professional career has been at Bell Canada, which is a national Canadian leader in telecom. Um, so I would like to see how businesses are run on, a, on an international scale. That's kind of the experience that I'm looking for. Um, so that's maybe something when I graduate, but ultimately I do plan to, where I'm sitting now, I do see myself coming back. Okay, so uh, Michael? Yeah, for myself, it's, there's no question that at some point I would like to be working in the United States, I think, or, or in the rest of the world, to be completely honest with you. I think as a Canadian, uh, there's so much opportunity within Canada, but there is so much more at the beginning of your career outside of Canada. I mean, the whole world really is your playground when you have such globalization and the skills we have. So I really see it as I'm going to have to start there. That's going to have to be my springboard. And hopefully, at the end of the day, it'll bring me back to Canada. So, Sean? So I started in Canada, and then I did go to the US for two years. Um, for my startup, we did a program with Microsoft in Seattle, and then we raised some venture capital money in Seattle, and they insisted that we have part of our team there. So I spent two years in Seattle, but then I came back to Montreal um, for a variety of reasons we can get into later. Um, but really, I'm back here now. I could see myself going back to the States, um, but I do see myself ending up in Montreal, ultimately. Is that from a family perspective? Is that why you want to come back home to Canada? Family, lifestyle, um, there, there are several reasons, but I, I, I see Canada as home. So when you get down to the States, you fit in? Well, I'm a dual citizen, so it's, it's much easier for me. Um, also, Seattle is very much like Canada. It's, uh, it's very close to Vancouver. It's like the American Vancouver, I always say. Um, I think I would want to be more on the West Coast or Upper East Coast um, if I were to be in the US. Um, but I, I definitely did fit in in Seattle. I think as an English Canadian, we, we pass as Americans fairly readily, and it's a very comfortable society. Mm -hmm. Well, we can argue NFL and presidential politics. We, they may disagree, but we can argue about Trump and Clinton in a way almost no one else can. So it's, it's a natural sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So coming back home, when you travel and you get out there, do you feel Canadian? Is that something you feel strongly? different than other, uh, than America, for example? I, I certainly feel Canadian when I travel. I have, I've never lived outside of the country, but I've traveled all over the world, Russia, Thailand, all over Europe. Um, I, I find often when you are traveling and people know and find out that you're Canadian, it's very well received, very well regarded, respected. Uh, it's something that I, I personally wear very proudly. So when you think about that, but. Do you feel like this is where not only you belong, but it's sense that philosophically you feel more comfortable here? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, the, the philosophy Canada has and shares with a lot of countries is very different from the United States. And I think when you are traveling particularly and someone says to you, oh, you know, where, which state are you from? You kind of laugh and you say, you know, I, I'm a Canadian and they always receive it positively. I think that that is something, especially in Commonwealth countries, that we really find a, a point of connection anywhere in the world. You're, you're in Australia, you're in New Zealand, you're in the UK. Really, all those countries have a lot of respect for Canadians, and I have a lot of pride saying I'm a Canadian when I'm down there. So, Sean, do we overstate it as Canadians? Is, is it that different in the States, in your experience? You've actually lived there for a few years. I would say, I mean, there, there are a lot of similarities, especially depending on where you are. So, in Seattle, it's very outdoorsy. Everyone's very into fitness, and, yeah. and it's very similar to Vancouver, Montreal. Um, in terms of or how are we different? Well, I always said I was Canadian. I am American as well, but I would always identify as Canadian. And that was always received very well. People just, they would trust me a little bit more. They'd think I was a little bit friendlier. Um, and that's, that's not really a bad thing. So what, what, what does Canada bring to the world? We talk about Canada needs, the world needs more Canada. I feel like it's an advertising slogan I've heard somewhere, but what is it that Canada brings to the world in our better moments? From, the, from your perspective. Who would you like to say? Okay. 
Well, anyone, sure, go ahead. Well, not you guys, but go ahead, Michael. I, I mean, I think in my opinion, the biggest thing about Canada is our openness and our friendliness, which you touched on. I think it's very accurate. We are a very open and friendly culture. And, you know, my, my favorite iconic moment that you know you're in Canada is when you're walking along the street and you see tourists with a map. They're never alone. It's always, there's a Canadian jumping right in to help them. And I feel like that's not a sense you get in every country. And I think that, that sense of everyone is looking out for everyone and everyone really cares about the well-being of everyone around them is... The, the essence of the Canadian spirit, in my opinion. Agreed. Well, it's very Canadian if yeah. you do agree like that, so. <laughs> Sean, anything to add, or? I mean, I, I think you said it pretty nicely. Um, Canada is just, it, it's a friendly place, and people, people understand that. Do you think that, is there a sense that we see, is there racism here in Canada? Do you run into that at all? Do you see that? I mean, you're Jewish, you, you know, you're different backgrounds as well. Do you see that happening in your lives at all? Do you run into prejudice to some degree? I think it exists, but to a much lesser degree. I mean, it exists everywhere in the world. Yeah. And I'd say it exists to a lesser degree than, than most places, but I, I would definitely say it exists. But I mean, do you run into comments about being Jewish at all from time to time? Is I, it I, I don't. I feel as a person surrounded by upper class educated people that you know, racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia is all really uh, a lower, lower tone. But, but there are definitely, I mean, I've interacted with people who, who have all those traits. Okay. Sean, would you be taken as a visible minority? I'd say so. Um, okay. I'm half Indian. Okay. Um, but I've, I've never really felt that I was different from anybody else in Canada. So my best friends growing up were Jewish. Okay. Um, I never, I didn't have any other Indian friends actually. And that was, never, that was never a question. I was always just like everybody else. So you haven't heard comments or things that, you didn't grow up with that, those kind of comments? If anything, they thought I was smarter than them because I was Indian. <laughs> okay, it's a very positive prejudice. <laughs> um, it's funny, I, I, I consider myself Canadian, but my background is Italian, which is half Egyptian, half Italian, and that's, that's what I call it. <laughs> and um, it's funny because I think it's very Montreal that we're, there's a huge mix. We're like a melting pot of cultures and nationalities. And I look at my friends and uh, people call us the United Nations because I have you know, a friend from Pakistan, a friend from Iran. I have uh, friends from, from Israel, from India. Like we're you know, very, very diverse, different cultures. I personally have not, well, I personally have not uh, experienced any type of racial prejudice. I do know some of my friends in growing up in the South Shore, they were immigrants. Um, they had some challenges, certainly. Um, but again, I think we're surrounded with you know, the educated people and, and it's, it's not as common that I, I will see that. Okay. When you think about leadership, you looked at the, the current leaders, the senior leaders are boomers and generation Y, I guess. Do you see yourself as being different in terms of how you'll lead? And I mean, you're leaders now. How you lead now, do you see that it's a bit different in your experience? Michael, I mean, you're the MUS president, so you're a young leader. Yeah, so I think, I think today the biggest difference, or definitely the dichotomy amongst youth leaders, is the difference between activist leaders and, and centrist, moderate leaders. I think when you see a person like myself, who I consider to be you know, very moderate, very centrist, everything kind of appeals to everyone, nothing is too appalling. Those are the leaders we see in Canada as the, as the boomer leaders, whereas a lot of the young leaders you'll hear about today are activists, are extremely uh, partial to one view. And I think it, it is going to create an interesting dichotomy because that's not, that is not encouraged by our system. But that is what you see in the paper. When you hear about a 16-year-old leader, it's never someone who is very moderate, earned their systemic power through a process like boomers did. So I think that's kind of the interesting difference. But that might be just purely age as opposed to as they get older, they may take more of that approach. It's, it's hard to say. I'd, I'd hope to say that. I believe everyone will mature into my worldview, but you know, that's not necessarily <laughs> true. Well, it's good to have healthy self-confidence <laughs> anyway. So uh, Sean, do you see a difference in leadership with the older people than yourself? I think one of the biggest differences is that young leaders have technology um, at their disposal. So I was running a company um, in two different countries, Montreal and Seattle, we had an office in both, and that was only possible because we had Skype, we had, um, we had ways to communicate that didn't exist before. Um, people are mobilizing, they're becoming activists through Facebook, through Twitter. I mean, leaders today grew up with technology, and we're definitely using that to our advantage. 
So it's something where you don't have to be in the same office, let alone city, and have people work with you. Absolutely. And you're very relaxed about that. Absolutely. We got the best of both worlds. Montreal had certain advantages on the tax side, and the U.S. had certain advantages on the investment side. And we had two companies, and we had agreements between the two. See, at my age, I still want to go press the flesh sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, I need to, if someone works for me, I need to see them and have dinner with them and spend time with them. Mm -hmm. But that's something that doesn't, you don't need to have that. That's, I, I, I think that's still extremely important. The, the, there's nothing like face-to-face, -face, nothing. And, and uh, at Bell especially, you know, we're, we're in telecom and we've got video conference and it's like, it's as if the person is right in front of you, literally, just how, how real it is. Um, and I guess it, it works very well in, in team settings when you're, you're global or international. Um, I think depending on the business that you're in, the situation that you're in, nothing replaces FaceTime. Sean? I think you need a bit of both. So we okay. spent a lot of money traveling, coming back yeah, here yeah. To, to see our team, um, which was quite expensive. And ultimately, we did consolidate the offices again. Um, but it worked for two, three years. And we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we did without that initial uh, use of technology. But when you look to older leaders, do they seem out of touch at times, in a sense, from, from your generation viewpoint? I Just sir. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I think. Uh, if a leader is surrounded by young people, uh, I do think maybe their leadership style will change. Um, I know it's funny, I, at Bell I was working in the business market side and then I switched to residential and I tell people it was as if I switched companies completely in terms of just the, the cultural difference. So one was quite hierarchical and the other, now where I am, it's very flat, regular FaceTime with the president, with the VP, one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, and it's a very young and dynamic group. I think that contributes to how leadership uh, styles are, are adjusted. Yeah, I think it's hard to call one age group out of touch with the other because if they're not eye to eye, they're both out of touch with each other. So I always think to myself, well, if you've lived through my, entire, you know, my 1996 to, to 2015, they have lived through all of that. I never lived through the 60s, 70s, 80s. So, Yes, we have different views, and yes, we have different experiences, but it's hard for me to say what I've been taught in a history book about their life is any better than what they've observed maybe from a step back about my life, so. Yeah, I guess I've been al alive your whole life, so I understand it where you can't, yeah, it's fair enough, you can't understand the 70s. In the and same way. Yeah. We had better music. <laughs> That's up for debate. <laughs> well, Britney Spears, anyway, okay, we won't go there. Um, um, there's an, a very interesting concept uh, called reverse, reverse mentorship, where you're finding that now um, the traditional form of mentorship is, is a young person looking up to someone who's got a lot of life experience, work experience, and learning from them. And now we're, we're hearing about a reverse mentorship relationship where uh, that leader who has the, the time and the experience uh, learns from the younger leaders in terms of technology and, and advances. So it's, it's really interesting, the dynamic. You know, I figure uh, that I mentor a lot of young people, but when I was young, it was 100% one way, where now it's probably 75% I'm mentoring them. 25% of the time, Stephanie mentors me about technology and about um, t Taylor Swift, various things like that, which is, appears to be important. What? Not Taylor. Of all... I would say Spice Girls. That was my generation growing up. <laughs> the Spice Girls were in the 80s. Do you know who the Spice Girls are? I've heard of them. I've read heard about them. Heard of them. them. <laughs> Saw them in a museum. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so do you see yourself reverse mentoring? Yes. I definitely have mentors in my life who I think I'm adding value to. So how do you add value to them? I think it, largely it is technology. It's, you know, did you know that, you know, all these data mining, all these things that you probably know exist but don't really understand fundamentally the value of, I think oftentimes when you're able to get through life without these things, you don't feel that they're absolutely necessary. But for me, I've never been able to get through life without a cell phone. So I under... You I can't understand. remember the dark days before cell phones though. I'm pretty sure cell phone was invented after I was born. I mean, before I was born. Yeah, it was. Yeah. In fact, yeah, it's... Yeah, I guess I was riding a dinosaur before. Yeah, like it, yeah. it goes back to the 80s. But I remember cell phones that you put in the trunk. They were so big that you had to have something in your trunk. But yeah, so you just simply do not remember. Do you remember before Facebook? 
Yes, yeah. I remember when Facebook became popular. Yeah, my kids don't remember before Facebook. So it's really, it's, it's quite a different world. So technology, you guys just totally, don't people look at their phones too much? Yes, yeah. unequivocally, absolutely, 100%. I, it's honestly insanity to me when I watch two people sit across from each other eating dinner, at, like texting each other. It's, and they're on a date. Yeah, it's, it blows my mind, it absolutely blows my mind. Well, I feel better. But it's interesting, I, realize I don't have a watch, so I had to turn my phone on just now because I didn't know what time it was. And I no longer, do you guys own watches? Oh, okay. I actually, oh, like, I, I own them, but I don't wear them. So maybe watches are coming back, at least for the older I mean, they're, they're fashion items now more than time pieces. I think even when I wear a watch, I still check my phone for the time. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, uh, it's, it's quite intriguing. It's, just, it's really spectacular how, how cell phones have evolved, though. If you, if you think about it, at one point they were just, it was phone calls. And now it's like a one, all the information you can ever need in your life is in your cell phone. You have access to the internet. Uh, on a daily basis, you'll, uh, I'll use it for phone calls, emails, music. I have my, my workout app on there that I, I'll go to the gym and I have my own personal trainer in my phone. Um, news, it's just, it's got everything. So it's hard to imagine what you were before it because it, it's just so different. It's changed, it's, it changes lives. Well, I have three 20-year-old research assistants, and when the phone rings, it's like a snake. They go, what's that? Like, they honestly seem surprised that it's ringing, and, and you say you answer it. I say it very gently, and, and they, they, they honestly seem surprised because they text all the time and things like that. But it, it, it's, it's a, technology has changed how we interact with each other, so, mm -hmm. for sure. Certainly. When you look at the world out there, what are the biggest problems facing humanity today in your minds? What are the things that we should, as Canadians, as the world, what, are we, what, what should we be worried about, or think about at least? I think if you had to choose one issue, it would be income disparity, because I think that leads to, if you talk about hunger, if you talk about malnutrition, if you talk about even disease spreading, I think all of those really root in, in income disparity. And do you, I mean, you see that in Canada. Yeah. It's probably more in the States. And other parts, some other, you know, India, I would think, from my experience, there's enormous disparity. What should we do in Canada about that, then? Well, I mean, it's obviously a very, very hard question. If I had the perfect answer, I, I probably would be not, you know, not here, you know, fixing the problem. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing, and that Canada is doing a good job of, is, is education and enabling, you know, it's still not perfect. Like, I still, I went to high school with kids that, never ever had the amb ambition of becoming like what I call an alpha generator, like someone who's gonna patent something, someone who's gonna be a CEO, someone who's going to be doing something no one else can do. I have a lot of, I have a, a, probably the majority of my friends aspire to, to do a, a job that's trading time for money, which I still think we haven't really cracked the egg yet on changing a culture where that, where that is no longer an acceptable thing to do. But sometimes, I had some of my students going on LinkedIn, connecting with Miguel alumni in Bogota and Santiago to invite them to drinks. At a certain point, you know, after about two or three minutes, I said to them, I said, uh, is this fun? And they go, no, it's work. And I just said, I'm only happy it's you, not me. And they laughed, I think. But it was a, isn't it called work? Like, don't you have to work sometimes? Like, it's not all fun. Yeah, abso absolutely, you have to work. But I think the point is your work, your, your cost is the, the labor, your time, but your reward has to be something more than just money. It has to be, I'm learning something. Those kids probably aren't doing it for the 12 bucks they're getting. They're probably doing it no, to they're not endear themselves paid. to you. Or, they're just being helpful. Okay, well, so, so then that's positive. I don't think that's work. I think that's labor in exchange for something more valuable than money. So what drives people to work in your mind, your generation? Sean, what drives people to want to work today? It was money for the boomers to some degree. We measured ourselves by how big our house was, the kind of car we drove, things like that in our lower moments. There's a famous bumper sticker. He who has the most to toys when he dies wins. <laughs> Isn't that sad? But it's something where you measured by where you live, what kind of car you So we use car sharing. So I'm, I'm, when I go to play hockey, I'm a loser because I have a car sharing car. But I'm more environmentally friendly. What is it you guys are looking for from work beyond money? Sean? So there are many, there are many different ways that you can make money. I think you absolutely need um, to make a salary in order to live and, and to be happy. 
Um, but that's not all you need. And that's kind of been the driving force behind uh, my career so far. Um, I've always wanted to, to work such that I was trying to alleviate the, the income disparity. Um, because I think that, that leads to a lot of issues, like you said, Michael. Um, you know, in, in proper access to, to nutrition, to healthcare. And I've seen a lot of very valuable and, and inspiring projects which enable you to, to tackle this. For example, um, Mohammed Ashur, he's two years above me in my program. He's a CEO of Aspire. And they won the Holt Prize uh, a couple years ago. And their company um, developed a new way to farm crickets. And now they're doing this in local communities in Mexico, in Africa. They're teaching them how to, how to farm crickets in order to, to feed the population. I mean, at, at my company, we were developing games for physical rehab. So if you've had a stroke, you can now play a game at home, and you can do your stroke rehabilitation. Stroke rehab is a very expensive and laborious process. It takes years and a lot of money in order to, to recover from this. What we've done is made it accessible for everybody. And, and we want to, to take our profits down the road, some of our profits from North America, to subsidize it in other countries as well. So I think there are many ways that you can build companies which, which help, which do more than just make money. I mean, that's truly moving, both examples you give, and you go, boy. But how does a bell, a L'Oreal, so I had the CEO of L'Oreal come to class, and it's lipstick. Like, how do you bring meaning and purpose when you sell soap and lipstick and stuff like that? Because most of our companies, we have to do things like that, don't we? Well, I think we're all taught the premise that social entrepreneurship works and charity effectively doesn't. And I think that that is the fundamentals. You need to create something that will self-sustain, will generate money, will be able to provide people with, with a salary, but is doing good. So I think when you say, okay, well, they're selling lipstick, you know, if they just donate their profits, that's never going to fix the problem. It's a matter of perhaps you could sell lipstick that tests for drugs in drink, or you could sell lipstick that is you know, UV protective, or you could sell something that could, could help. So the challenges for companies that we buy from is, we go to Loblaws or Metro, how do you make that, you can give some money to charity, but how do I make that, because if I'm an executive, I've got to have meaning in the company I run, I think, for you guys. You're looking for meaning, Steph, are you? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, looking for a greater purpose, I think to the comment about uh, Bell and you know how does Bell have meaning? There's sorry. Uh, I'll I'll take my position on that. Big corporate companies contribute yes in the products that they sell and the services they serve. So on one side, Bell connects people. I FaceTime with my grandmother. That's on Bell's wireless network. That's an that's an example. We come together and watch TV this on Bell TV. This panel has been brought to you by Bell. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like that. <laughs> That's one, one component, but Bell is also, and uh, uh, some of you may have seen in the media, we're very, very active on um, mental health and trying to reduce the stigma in Canada associated with mental health and contributing you know, millions of dollars annually to that cause. So although companies you know, could be very capitalist and only profit-seeking, there are other ways that they, that they give back. You interviewed the CEO of Via Rail. Yeah. And he, he, seemed, he was genuinely excited, but he, he seems to feel everybody at VIA has a meaning and a purpose. Right. You recall that, what that was? Help me out. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't put you on the spot. But it was really inspiring because what he's saying is that, and when I get on VIA, I enjoy riding it. Like, they're, they're genuinely nice people on VIA. And they're down to earth, they're not, you know, they're there to help you, and they're genuinely nice. And it's something where, we're transporting Canada in an environmentally friendly way, and that is important. Mm -hmm. And you go, the guy or the woman cleaning the train goes, my life has meaning from that purpose. Where it's that, I think what we have to do is imbue everything with a sense of meaning and purpose beyond making money. Does that, does that resonate for you guys? Mm -hmm. But you seem, I, I think the undergraduates are particularly excited about social entrepreneurship. Oh yeah, I mean, particularly excited about it. I mean, you can say I've been indoctrinated, but I believe it, I believe it works. Like for the whole prize, I know, like we have a, I'm with a team that's going to London. I think we have another team going as well. That's something that everyone wants to do. It's something that I think people really, really see social entrepreneurship as a way to easily access this happiness and utility you're getting beyond money, whereas uh, it's something that our society has been encouraging. We're offering a million dollars to two teams that can yeah. do this. We're offering $100,000 to six teams that can do it. And it's a, uh, 
it really is something that we are encouraging as an institution. Our educational yeah. system is, is encouraging it. So yes, I would say I'm indoctrinated by it, as are my peers. Are there jobs out there, though? You have, well, as with all entrepreneurship, you create the jobs. Yes, you could work for a social enterprise, for sure. Yeah. But I, I really believe to work for a cause that you really care about, it has to be your own cause. And, and causes may be very similar, but I find, it, I find the concept of adopting a cause, like, oh, I, I believe in mental health. It's a cause I've adopted. I really, really care about it. But there's so many different, there's an infinite degrees that you could focus on, as with anything. Yeah. So I think being a social entrepreneur and driving your own idea is kind of that epitome of, of utility you can get out of a business. Now, sometimes older people, older people might tell me there's nothing like children and a mortgage to focus the mind. So a certain degree, might you, does that resonate with you at all? Or you go, look at, I'm gonna look for meaning regardless of how, are you guys gonna have a mortgage? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, how cheap credit is nowadays, I'd love to have a mortgage. This is a finance uh, person, investment management person. But I mean, do you see kind of, what kind of, house would you like, or living space would you like to have if you had a family in 10 years? What, what do you see yourself? Is it, you grew up in Brossard, was it? And I was in the West Island. I okay. was in the West Island, my friends were in Brossard. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So do you see yourself growing up in the West Island and having a house with double car garage and that sort of thing? Um, maybe not the West Island, it's quite far. I'm really tired of driving back and forth. Um, I really like Nuns Island. I would like to live by the water. I'd like to live in Westmount maybe one day. Those are, those are my aspirations. But yeah, I do see myself buying a house, settling down, starting a family, balancing that with career, community. I, I do see myself having that full package eventually, yeah. I don't want to put pressure on you, Michael, but... Uh... Oh, I, I think I have a vision for what I want now, but it'll obviously change, you know. I, I, I'm just as close to being, you know, nine years old as I am to having kids, so I would say, Right now, I, I'm, I gotta, I'm not entirely sure what you just meant by that. But so you're 20. Yes. Yeah, so okay. So let, okay. Fine. That's fine. So my my logic is I, I want to you know live at the beach. I'm a beach bum. I want to surf every day. I want to live in Hawaii. But that's probably not going to be realistic. And, and I know like my wife will probably decide. So it doesn't really. Well, make I taught to Hawaii for a couple summers. So but it's awesome. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. But it was so expensive. It was unbelievable. And to, we, to they live. offered me a job, but it was just so outrageously expensive we couldn't possibly afford it with, you know, anything reasonable. But anyway, so, so Sean, do you see that as part of your life, family, that sort of thing, or is that just too far off to worry about? Um, I'd like to finish medical school first, but shortly after that, definitely. Yeah. Um, I would personally like to live downtown. Um, that, that's kind of my, my dream. I'm not big on, on driving, and I think that's one thing which uh, Canada is really excellent at. Our public transport is phenomenal. Um, and so I almost lived in Houston, I almost lived in several big U.S. states where you need to have a car. Like, that, that's not even an option. Whereas in Montreal, I get my exercise by walking to school or walking, I walk everywhere, really. And that's not something you can necessarily do in the states. There's a number of my uh, students I've taught, they're now in their 30s and have families, live in old Montreal, they live in condos, they go to parks with their kids. So kind of what their parents had, they're not going to have. I mean, I, I grew up with the, the big backyard, the big front yard, my neighbors, we, we would all congregate in the streets, like playing outside. That was really my childhood and it was, it was a great childhood. So I don't, I don't know if I would like to live downtown or in the old port and, and have a family there, maybe when, when my children are small. But I do intend to have, you know, a lawn and, and barbecues and things like that, similar to what I had. So we, we talked about a big issue of income disparity. What is the big issue or two in your mind the world's facing now that your generation's gonna have to wrestle with? Steph? I think, I think in Canada particularly, what, what I find we're challenged with today is innovation. Uh, we are heavily dependent on our natural resources and I think Canada really has to be the leader in innovation, whether that's to be attracting uh, young entrepreneurs investing a lot in education and, and building a very entrepreneurship culture is, I think, critical in, in our next move. And, and the government, I know that Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, has uh, this innovation agenda platform and he's investing, uh, I believe, several million over the course of three years. Is it 
20 million, 2 million every, every year for three years. And uh, I think that's, that's really the way to go um, and kind of put us ahead and, and make Canada the, the leader in, in innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and really compete, not only, uh, compete on services and technology and not on just products and, and resources because that's not where the world's moving. So what he's talked about is resource economy versus in innovation, we need to move the, so you would buy that's into right. that thought. Absolutely. But should we just be a bit more American? More entrepreneurial, more open to taking risk. Is that? I, I don't think America. I, I don't think we can only concentrate on the U.S. With with globalization, our competitors are all over the world. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship anymore. So we've got to keep our sights out internationally and not just within you know our neighboring regions. Okay. I think we need to take the best from American. I mean, I think that's, yes, we need to be more entrepreneurial. Yes, America is very entrepreneurial, <laughs> but there are a lot of things that have came with that culture that now we've seen don't work in our worldview, and we need to appropriate what does work and, and learn from their mistakes and, and build our own. So you like Canada, be a bit more entrepreneurial, more been innovative. Is that the kind of change that you want to see to Canada? Yeah, certainly, certainly. Like, I, I, I feel, as a Canadian, it's hard to be an entrepreneur. Like, I've, I feel if I had a great business idea, I'm sure you know, there's, there's a lot, there are barriers to being in Canada as an entrepreneur, which are, there are barriers in the US too, but they're, lo they're lower and they're much more, there's much more assistance to surmount them. So how do we, I was down in the Silicon Valley, McGill alumni a couple weeks ago, over 2,000 McGill alumni on LinkedIn in, in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Huge presence there. How do we keep Canadian entrepreneurs in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, you know, other places? Sean, you've been an entrepreneur, you were in Seattle. How do we keep Canada vital for entrepreneurs? What's your thoughts? I mean, there, there is money in Canada from a, a venture capital perspective and from angels. The issue is Canada is 10, 10, 20 years behind the US in terms of deal, in terms of deal terms. So we had term sheets from the BDC, from Ange Quebec, um, and, and then we got a term sheet from a US uh, VC and it was night and day. Um, the Canadian investors had a clause in there where they could take their money back um, in two years if they weren't happy. I mean, that, that doesn't work for, for entrepreneurs. The U.S. had nothing like that. Um, the, the valuation was twice as high in the U.S., and it's the same company. The U.S. really valued um, what we could offer much more. It's not that there's a lack of money. It's just there's a lack of, they don't have the same mentality. They're, they're not as, uh, as open to, to getting entrepreneurs at, at the same cost that U.S. VCs are. So the solution is move to Silicon Valley, or no. Seattle, as you did. Just adjust the terms. But how do we get Canadian bankers, and it was great during the financial crisis. We're all proud of Canadian banks during the crisis. But we'd like them to be really good during a crisis, then really relaxed when it's not a crisis. Except for we don't know when it's going to be a crisis, is the, the whole of that one. So it almost seems like it's just a cultural thing. And how do we change Canadian financiers and bankers to be more more like Americans? I think it boils down to risk aversion. I think yeah. one, of the, one of the biggest things that defines Canada is risk aversion. And I always say, like, I, I don't like to take risks. And that I think a lot of Canadians would agree with, whereas a lot of Americans would disagree. So there's, there's that thing. There's culturally, we're probably more risk averse. But then the question is, is that a bad thing? Well, probably not, because there are times, as you said, when it's good to be risk averse. So it's, I think it's a, it's a matter of, overcoming our risk aversion in a sustainable way. So not doing what the US did in 08, where they just kind of threw money at high risk debt, but it's about managing the, the return on, is it worth it? Yes, if we can foster more entrepreneurs, and if investing in this will lead to more entrepreneurs developing more ideas, maybe it, maybe it pays to be a little well, There's more. subprime mortgages, which is a very different thing in terms of lending to almost anyone. Yeah. But it's the entrepreneurs who go, here's a, a young, here's a person who's got an idea that's actually made, you know, has moved it along. Like, that's a different thing. It's kind of, where do we get money for those people? That's what we want to be more American-like. So I guess it just, it's, it seems like it's almost an intractable problem. It, it depends, though, because Canada's kind of made up for that in other ways. So Quebec, in particular, has some amazing tax credit programs. Um, so the scientific research uh, and development pro uh, program, uh, SHRED, is, is phenomenal. And that's why we had ended up coming back to Montreal. I can claim 80% of the salaries from my developers back from the government. You get a check at the end of the year for 80% of the salaries. So not only can we, we can pay our salary, we can pay higher salaries, 
because we know we're getting that money back. Um, there's a reason why Montreal is a hotspot for game companies um, and for some healthcare companies. There are multimedia tax credits. These don't necessarily exist in the States. So while Canada doesn't finance companies as well in terms of the VC side, they make up for it by, uh, by giving back money uh, for salaries. It's a very Canadian solution in a way. We have high taxes. Mm -hmm. We're, we're risk-averse, but the government will provide that. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it's, we don't mind, well, we don't love high taxes, but we're reasonably content. Is that a fair statement? You guys reasonably content? You look content. But it's something where we accept it anyway, and so we kind of accept this as a way it should go forward. So you guys, you're happy with that kind of approach? I would like to comment on the, the risk aversion. We've had, um, Professor Moore has a, also a class in the MBA program called CEO Insights. And every single class through the whole semester we have really notable CEOs that come and speak. And we had a, a group of angel investors and venture capitalists that had come in and spoke about entrepreneurship. And, and I find that there's actually a lot of MBA students who have that desire. And a lot of them are risk averse. One of, one of my uh, classmates said, you know, I'm planning to start a family. Uh, I don't know if it's a good time. And if now is not a good time, when will be a good time? And it, it wasn't only the risk aversion that we spoke about, but it was the stigma of failure in Canada versus the US. And these entrepreneurs said, you know, in Canada, there's a huge stigma surrounding failure. And, and studies have been done. And uh, entrepreneurs, one of their biggest fears when starting a business is bankruptcy in Canada. So it's, it's a cultural one of, one of the, the main elements. And, and my colleagues here have mentioned it. It is a cultural shift that's required to follow our, our American counterparts. OK. I'm, none of you mentioned climate change. When I talk to many undergraduates, sorry, Michael, uh, this is something they talk about as an issue that they're concerned about because, you know, you guys will be around and then your kids or grandkids, like, it's a, you're thinking 100 years from now. Yeah. Is it climate, isn't climate change a huge issue in your mind? Yes, climate change is an issue in my mind, but I would say I, I prefer to, to think about things that I think I have some control over. And as someone that's never studied a, opened a scientific textbook, I... I don't feel I could ever defeat climate change. So there's, yes, obviously there's changes you can make to businesses you operate, you can be more sustainable, you can be more environmentally efficient, but those are all, I think, band-aid solutions. I really don't think but, you know, carbon credits and these kind of little punishments are going to be things that will replace completely revolutionizing our fuel sources, for example, which is something I will never be able, I'm never gonna be able to make a car that runs on nuclear fusion, right? I can never, I will never be able to create that. But that seems like in 50 years the world could collapse, which makes all these other things we're discussing irrelevant if the world, like, so what do you think, Sean? Uh, that was my number two answer. Oh, okay. the biggest problem. <laughs> um, like Michael, I I've, I've know very little about this. I took one geography class in undergrad and basically it said the, the carbon tax system didn't work very well. Um, I don't know what other solutions there are, but I think it is definitely a, a very big problem. I, I'm just not the right person to, to give a solution. Have, have you changed your behaviors because of that? Like, do you walk a bit more? Do you, is that, do you think about those things at all in your behavior, honestly? Just for us on the television cameras? I take my car. I, I live in the West Island. I work on Nuns Island, and I go to school downtown. So in terms of transportation, the train will take me from, it will take me an hour and a half to get to work. It will take me from, the, just the system, the way that it works today and the transportation, the train, my class ends at nine, I'd have to be at the train station for 9.15 to get back to the West Island. And if I miss that train, there's no other trains that run thereafter. So I do think there's improvements that, that are needed, you know, in terms of at least the train scheduling. I haven't been able to be that eco-friendly in terms of driving, okay. unfortunately. I mean, my understanding is that if you look at fossil fuel emissions as kind of your issue with, with climate change, one flight, a flight from Vancouver to London, I think I was told emits more fossil fuels, or maybe it's there and back, than I will doing everything else, driving everything else in the rest of my life put together. So I see it as sure, I could cut out driving to save fossil fuels, yeah. but it's infinitesimal compared to, to flight. And that's something I'm, I'm obviously never gonna be able to not fly. So I think it's the type of thing for me where yes, I like to make changes so I can feel good about myself and, and I totally see the value in feeling good about yourself because you're doing a good thing. But in terms of real impact, I don't, 
I really don't think the little things are going to sum up in any material sense. And, and, uh, you know, I've, we, we don't own a car to save money. Let's be honest. We have teenagers. So we, it saves money, but it's partly, and uh, we're in better shape. But we actually feel more righteous or something because we are less negative impact. And I do think about what I'm throwing out and recycling. I think about those things actively. Because I guess I'd rather light a candle or, you know, what's that, you know, light a candle than just say, curse the darkness, this sort of thing. So I'm slightly discouraged by this. I do recycle. Okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> if I could redeem my, my driving habits with recycling. Okay, no, that's fine, but it's something where, but on the other hand, I'm taking, you might point out, Michael, I'm taking 40 people to, on, my, on a plane yeah. to Santiago, then to Bogota, to Armenia, Cartagena, Bogota, and to Toronto, so I really screwed up. On the other hand, I'm it's expanding. All one, it's all one plane, so you know, it's no worse than. That's true, but it's something where you know, we're expanding young people's minds. We're part of a global economy. We're doing very good things, mm -hmm. but there's an environmental negative to that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Do you have another big issue that you're concerned about? As Canadians or as the, as the world? Well, as Canadians in the world. I was, I was very touched by the, the Syrian refugees. I think Trudeau did a, a, a wonderful job bringing in 25,000 of them. And I know Canadians really stepped up to the plate to welcome them. That was something that, that really resonated with me. I know maybe a lot of you saw that, that video, that, uh, not the video, the picture of that little boy on the beach that went viral. It was, I think that's really what shifted everybody's attitude and made it so much more real, just the desperacy of the situation. Um, I do think the, the unrest in the, in the Middle East is quite concerning and um, just national security is, is a big issue on the agenda. Uh, just the, the atrocities that are happening, it, it's, for me personally, it's, uh, it's very, very worrisome and bothersome, if I could point out another world problem. It seems like life is pretty good in Canada. Like even climate change, it, there could be some positives. Like if we have less winter, I don't think anyone's going to complain here, other than ski hole operators maybe. But, you know, it's a good life. Immigrants become Canadians. My grandparents were Finnish and Irish, but I'm just Canadian. You're the same way. I think all of us will be, become Canadian, regardless of our parents or immigrants or grandparents. So it's something where we're really lucky in Canada. We don't have a lot of the social ills. We have less of the, the, the 99 and 1%, or the 1% 99. But are we just being maybe a bit smug and just enjoying ourselves a bit too much in a way? I mean, no, I, I don't think so. I think Canada does, when you look, I mean, accepting refugees is, is definitely one thing. There's, I know people argue that it, well, it's kind of a PR thing, like you're just accepting refugees people are going to talk about, whereas you could be accepting other refugees that no one's going to talk about. But, but just that, I think, does really point to an example that we do care. And we are, we're not sitting back and being smug. We are trying, at least, trying our best to, to help others. Okay. How's, how's, uh, how's Justin doing? Well, he, uh, I mean, Mr. It's the <laughs> Prime Minister, we should call him the Prime Minister, I guess, yeah. is more appropriate. Yeah, I think that's one of the funny things, is so many people I know seem to know Justin. I guess just being around Miguel, know him personally, so it kind of makes a different... No, I, I'd met him years ago, and I moved here, and he was, uh, I introduced him at things. So I ran into him a number of times, and his wife was kind of, if I see him, I... I'd call him Justin, but then I would stop and feel guilty and go, I guess we don't call him Mr. Prime Minister, so Mr. President, but as Prime Minister, I would show that respect for the office. And I, but is he doing well? Are you excited about this, about this guy, Sean? I mean, my, my opinion about you know, government in Canada and democracy in general is like, what really is the difference between doing well and doing poorly? Like the, the fundamental Canadian nature, our, our farthest left party and our farthest right party both believe we should have free health care. And I think it's, we're, we're all so centered that the, the most radical changes are things that I would probably never even notice happening. So, yeah, I think he's doing a great job. He, I mean, he hasn't upset me at all. He hasn't impacted my life. It would be great if he could make it so Canadians could go work at banks in New York. But other than that, like, he's not really going to do anything that's going to impact me. Sean, what do you think of uh, the Prime Minister? So, unfortunately, I've been living under a bit of a rock since I started med school in September. Um, <laughs> okay. I haven't taken biology or chemistry since CEGEP uh, nine years ago, so this is all very new for me. Um, I've had to work very hard at that, um, but it seems like he's doing a good job. Yeah. 
I think uh, you know he's he's started off very well. He's surrounded himself with a very strong, diverse team. Uh, he's got even some young people on board, Melanie Jolie, which is uh, which is great. Um, I, I really think you know it's uh, you know he's speaking publicly about innovation, putting in programs and an agenda. He has a plan, which I think uh, is certainly very exciting. He's also the the youth minister. If I believe so, so you know, I, I'm I'm totally on board. Really, really looking forward to see what he can bring. So politics. Is there is a possibility of a career in politics of interest? Yeah, I, I wanted to be the governor of the Bank of Canada until a year ago. So I would I definitely want to be somehow at some point. But the governor of the Bank of Canada is not, not really a politician, but it's so, po like public sector. But if you become the governor of the Bank of Canada, we're going to play this tape and you can say you were there when he first said it. So you've changed now. You don't want to be the head of the Bank of Canada? I, I want to be, I wanted to do because I was extremely patriotic and I wanted, I thought that was a way I could really help my country. Okay. Um, but I've realized that that's a completely flawed worldview. You can help your country way more in the private sector than you can in the public sector. So. I really, I don't think it's where I want now to focus. We have some uh, government people here from Ottawa, so they're not entirely pleased with that thought. But I'm sorry. No. Um, but you want that's what you believe. Is yeah, that, but but I would like to be involved at some. Maybe it's from age 50 to 70. Maybe it's you know later in life. But I really do. I want to. When be you're practically some. dead. Yes. Yeah. So. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying not to take it personally, but no. So Sean, politics or is that? So I'll, I'll never say no to anything. Um, I never saw myself in a startup or in medical school when I was young. Um, I think the only reason why I would choose to go into politics is if there was a reason. Um, for example, I'm, I think one of the biggest problems in, in Canada and, and North America is, is going to be the, the rising demand for, for healthcare services. Mm. And so that, that's kind of what I'm trying to dedicate my career towards. And one of the biggest issues we have is that we can use technology for so many different applications. Um, tele telemedicine, for example. I mean, you could treat people without actually being face to face with them. But right now, there's no reimbursement code for that. So physicians don't get paid for that time. Um, this is especially an issue in Canada where we have a lot of people living in the northern part of Canada. Um, there have been some initiatives to get reimbursement for telemedicine, but none of that's gone through yet. So if, as the healthcare minister, I could push that agenda, that's the reason why I would go into politics. All right. Certainly. Yeah. Um, I think government, working in government, you, you really impact the lives of Canadians, every decision that you make. And I think um, there is a strong, uh, we're, all, we're all in business school, so I, I do think there's a strong uh, connectedness between businesses and government. And you have to work as partnerships. And whether I'm on the business side or the government side, I, I definitely see myself, you know, one day open to that. So business is often lecturing government. Let me ask in theory, if we turn that around, what can business learn from government? Now I've asked some, uh, like Paul Tellier, who was the clerk of the Privy Council in Rambombardier, so he had an interesting answer. Again, you know, enormous life experience there. But just in theory, what can business learn from government, keeping in mind we have some government people in the audience? So what is it that they're good at that business should learn from? It's unfair to ask you because you haven't been in government or in business that long, you know, so any theories? Yeah, I mean, I think whenever you see a question on a test like why, you know, why do we account for tax differently than we account for financial accounting? And there, the answer is always there's different motives. The government's motive is to further social, economic, and political agendas, and a business's motive is to gener accurately forecast and create cash flow. So I would say what they can learn from each other and which business can learn from government is that it's not polarized. You have so many different objectives and maybe the government might feel, well, our job is not to have a balanced book, it's to have everyone be happy. And maybe a business might feel it's not to make people happy, it's to have a balanced book. I think they can always learn that you're constantly, it's a, it's a spectrum that is always fluctuating and that you can't just have one goal. I mean, that, well, that's what Paul said in government. You've got to worry about what does Quebec think, what does the Maritimes think, what does Alberta think, what does BC, th well, not so much BC. But, you know, we, we look at the whole country and you go, it, we've got to think about a number of set of agendas, and that leads us to a different path sometimes. And that's something in business. Is, what is the purpose of business? Is it to have a share price go up? That's what Wall Street thinks to a considerable degree in Bay Street. You guys are at business school. Is that the way business is about? 
I mean, I'd, I'd like to take a very philosophical argument that yes, it has to be about that because it's impossible to regulate all the other things. And I think that the, the, the concept of a business, of a, of a you know, public company, is very much not, not the norm in business anymore. A lot of people, as we talked about, want to be social entrepreneurs, okay. which, is, which is different. But I think you do need a class of enterprise in order for the free market to you know, enable us to, to save our money, enable me to earn an income and then be able to entrust it with someone who will make sure that that money is still worth something one day. You have to have a class of enterprise that exists to, to make money. I think the purpose of a business is to fuel an economy. You, whether you're public, private, a business employs people, people spend money, people have mortgages, um, and they, it, it creates jobs, of course, and people come up with ideas and they innovate and they contribute to the economy and they create products or services that they export and you get investments and trade and I, I think that's the ultimate purpose of a, of a company and to, you have to make profit, you have to make money for a, a company to function, so it's, it's all related. I think um, companies do need to make money, but there, there is more to it than just the money. Um, you guys have been talking about social entrepreneurship. You know, is it easy to get a job? How do people get into this? Um, there's actually a, a growing trend. Um, I have some friends in, in Singapore when we did the MBA trip. Um, I have some friends in Singapore that are getting into a sort of social venture capital. So it's the idea that you invest in companies where you get a, a set return. So you have your, your benchmark, just like in regular venture capital. Um, and then there's also a measurable social impact. So are they doing something, and, and there are ways to measure this, to quantify this. And so, so my goal is to have a practice, um, but also to start a, a VC fund of, of my own where I would engage in social venture capital investing. So I can create jobs for people like you. So we have a wide range of purposes for a business from, hey, it's my retirement, send me dividends, look after me to where there's social purposes, there's me bringing meaning to people's lives and so on. And you might argue that if I have meaning in my life, I'll work harder for you. I'll make you more money. So the two are often intertwined as well. So if I do my job as a leader motivating people, I'll make more money and the firm will make more money if I do it well. So there's kind of a different things floating around in there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, I'm gonna turn over to you in just a couple minutes for your comments or questions. I'm sure you have some comments based on what we've discussed. Um, education. How can education in Canada, you guys are all involved in it, how can we improve education in Canada, at the, particularly at the university level? Do you have any advice for, uh, for the Minister of Education? So to be 100% honest, um, and I know this will never happen, I think our education system needs to be completely, completely revolutionized. I think the way, even the concept of grade school, even the concept of giving marks, like the most fundamental things about our education system, I think are completely backwards. I think that we encourage, our education system funnels people towards values that are not what our societal values are. So for example, I go to school and I work extremely, extremely hard so I can get a good mark. And I memorize what, what will give me a good mark and not what will help me make a better world. If I if I am reading a textbook and I say that's extremely interesting, I'd love to read about that on Wikipedia, but I can't, I have to learn exactly my professor's worldview, which then we go out to the world and we're told that's not what you're supposed to do. That's one thing. I think the grade system, the grade school from all the six-year-olds are in a class together, all the seven-year-olds are in a class together, all the eight-year-olds are in a class together, is completely backwards as well. I think your age should not be the determinant of what you're being taught. There's so many other things. If my parents are, are physicians, I probably come in with a stronger background in, you know, in biology and medical sciences than someone whose parents would be lawyers who would come with a stronger background in, in oratory or in, or in philosophy. And I think there's so many different factors, yet the only factor we care about is age. When we decide what you're taught until university, the only thing that matters is age. I think that's, that's completely backwards. And I think when you look to the mental health issue, which I think we've identified is a tremendous issue in our society, our education system is a huge, huge cause of all that stress students face because it's so centric around these values that again, our society says, we go out to the real world, these values don't matter anymore, but we're so forced to focus on these values that are detrimental to our mental health. But we were talking That's, at dinner last night, when I was a student, I never studied on a Saturday night in my life, and I yeah. had four degrees. I just thought it was just not right. Yeah. 
But on the other hand, Michael, albeit with his girlfriend, but, so, but he still studies Saturday. Sean, do you study Saturday nights? Absolutely. Steph? So is the, world, is the day of the lecture done? Should we have videos and group discussion and stuff like that? I mean, it needs to be a variety. Like, you can't really say any medium of education is done, but okay. it needs to stop being so, so singularly focused, for sure. Didn't you take a class with me? I did, and that, that's one of the reasons why okay. I study commerce, is because okay. they're, not, they're not lecture. This you know, is him back, this class. is very good. This is how you recover, but so that's very well. Sean, should, how, what do we do to change education? Is it messed up and we need to really rethink it? I mean, McGill actually did something pretty good with their medical curriculum a few years ago. There used to be about six to seven hours of lecture every day, um, and then you'd go home and you'd have to study. Now it's three hours a day, and the rest is independent learning. So where you're weak or where you're interested, that's where you can spend that time. Um, and I think that that's been a phenomenal change. Um, I think I would, I would die in six hours of lecture a day uh, because it's just information overload, whereas now I get to go home and, and sort of learn what I think is important, and, and I'm doing pretty well that way. Um, in terms of McGill's education, I think one of the issues is not, it doesn't really prepare you for, for the workforce that, that well, um, in particular engineering. It was very theoretical, okay. um, which I learned, I learned how to work in teams. I learned how to problem solve, but I didn't really learn any, any valuable skills for what I was doing um, after that. So I think having more practical workshops, for example, um, entrepreneurship workshops, where you learn how to take an idea from you know, just the idea stage to getting some customer validation, maybe trying to get people to pay for it. I mean, that's, that's very valuable. And you can fail early and frequently in those kind of workshops, and that prepares you for you know, doing great things later on, because you learn from all those failures. Um, I would, I mean, I, I, now that I'm doing my master's, I feel as though uh, a degree will only get you so far so long as you can pair it with valuable work experience, in, in business particularly. Um, you, you really have to, if, if you're in competition with someone who's got a whole bunch of degrees and you have your degree and you have six years work experience, which is why I ended up pursuing my degree part-time to, to have that match, you are definitely at an advantage. Um, I think that the education system should certainly incorporate, and, and I know that they are doing it, um, uh, programs that allow students to also get work experience. There's, uh, there, there are certainly uh, things like that, but you know what, Mike, you touched upon something very interesting. There's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, and one thing uh, at the very beginning of the book, he talks about um, how, you know, it's the education system, but he was very particular on football and hockey. And he said that the most successful players, and, and they've, they did the study on this, the most successful players were born January, February, and March because they were physically, physically just bigger. Not that they had more talent. There's that 10,000, Professor Moore, you know, he says there's a 10,000 hour rule. You have to have 10,000 hours of practicing, whether it's a sport, whether it's an instrument, to be considered an expert. And these, the, the, the children that are born in January, February, and March happen to have those, not 10,000 hours, but more hours. They're physically bigger, so they get pushed ahead. And then it's just a matter of, you know, the self-fulfilling prophecy. They uh, are always told that they're better, they physically perform better, and they've built their confidence, and that in, results in just accelerating them throughout their lives. And that's kind of how the, the education system is also, also worked. I, I mean, I was born in March. I don't think I'm that much more advanced than anybody else, but it, particularly this is what happens in sports, which I thought was very, very interesting. Um, when and were you born, Sean? July. December. July. So we are in deep trouble, evidently. But well, go ahead. That's that's I, I I know there are. You're probably the outlier in that case. Okay. So uh, he did speak about, um, and I think that this can really help in tech with technology now, really paving the way and, and changing all sorts of industries, whether it's education, uh, taxi cabs with Uber. Uh, technology is really changing the way that we that we work, that we act, that we do business. And I think it can be implemented in school to uh, whether it's apps, education apps, where you know uh, this is what I read that these apps are designed in such a way that they can pinpoint exactly where the student has a weakness. And rather than everybody working at the same pace and focusing on the same 
types of problems, it's focused particularly and individually to that student to improve you know, where they're weak and help them accelerate personally. So that, you know, I thought was a really interesting way to uh, improve the education system. I guess that's a bit younger than us, but it could probably work for a university as well. If you have a question, maybe you could start meandering towards the microphones. Um, or a comment if you wish to correct us in some way. So uh, why don't we start over here with the younger person. <laughs> younger. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. Um, Can you just say your name or where okay. you're from or something? Yeah, my name is Wilkie Ron. I'm from Faculty of Arts. I'm double majoring in economics and German studies. So, wow. yeah, I mean, it's a little bit. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for your contribution to this panel. I learned a great deal from you. So I have, um, I have three questions for uh, each of you, actually. Uh, first of all, uh, Michael, well, why don't really, we just go with one and then come back for a second question later, Mary? Uh, just I mean, the it's other for people. individual. Questions. Oh, okay, go okay, ahead. So, That's fine. Uh, the question from Michael is like you emphasize the importance of technology and leadership. So, um, what to what extent do you see yourself in the future, or like uh, how would you combine? Uh, I know you're pursuing a, a MD and an MBA. So, what would you uh, apply your knowledge? Um, to, I mean, because you also mentioned the limited resources. Um, like, how would you apply your knowledge to kind of make the limited resources um, to, uh, to make it more accessible for more Canadians in the future? I think you meant you. I think you meant you, Sean. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'm looking to combine both technology, yeah. healthcare, and business innovation. Those are sort of my three degrees and my three passions. And mm -hmm. like, like I mentioned very briefly, I'm looking to start a fund where I could finance other young entrepreneurs who are building companies that use technology to address healthcare issues, to address um, any, any kind of social entrepreneurship, that's the kind of thing that I'm looking to fund. And so that's, that's sort of where I hope to contribute. Super. So what kind of specific, for example, jobs would you be? So the, the only model I have right now is the company that I, that I started, which was using, um, we partnered with Microsoft, we use the Microsoft Connect. It's sort of a, a, a camera which can tell the 20 major joints in your body and the angles between them. And so using this camera, you can do you know, physical rehab exercises from home, and we can tell without even being with you, sort of how are you moving? What's the quality of your movement? Um, what should you do next in your rehab? And so we, we make a fully automated program for people to do at home, um, which is fun, it's, it's lower cost, and, and they, they love it. So that's the kind of idea that, that we're trying to push forward. But Sean, for you to say what you're going to do in six years, mm -hmm. and in technology is almost impossible because who knows what it'll be in six years. That's it. So you'll just see how it unfolds. It's I probably mean, a, a fair way of putting it. I mean, there's, there's the Oculus Rift, which is sort of a more, um, it's like a, it's a virtual reality at, at the next level. I mean, there are all kinds of different things, but like you said, I mean, you don't really know where technology is going to be. Six years will be a different world. Yeah. Uber, the Uber GM come into one of our classes and what he was saying which was super interesting is that the jobs that existed you know when the company started have evolved into something else and we don't even know what the jobs that will be created in the future and that's that's the nature of technology is that jobs create themselves and you can't even predict you know where you're gonna end up maybe the job that I'm gonna be pursuing one day doesn't even exist yet so for sure and I have a question for Stephanie as well. Sure. And what would you see the rent-seeking perspective in um, innovation in Canadian business market? The, the what seeking perspective? Uh, rent-seeking, like pro in terms of making profits, like in innovation. How to make profits yeah. in, a, in a, the innovation like, What would you see, because those concepts are, um, um, they conflict with each other. So what would you see the rent-seeking perspective like in terms of innovation? Uh, I mean, rent seeking innovation. Question, isn't it? I don't. Uh, this is uh, actually a common, like, you don't really have to answer this question. No, I could answer it. I just, yeah. I, I didn't. How, how can, in, in an innovation economy, how can we make profits? Uh, they sort of conflict with each other. Making profits, you make innovation. Oh, innovation versus exactly. profits. Exactly. Um, not What's your view on this? I, th I think uh, with innovation comes profits eventually, as long as, you know, Look at look at all these different companies that centralize around innovation that are just so new to us. They're, they're, a lot of them are making profits. So I'm not I'm not sure uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, we can talk about it later. Okay. Yeah, sure. let's, let's do it offline. Sure. So, um, Will I Will Straw? Um, 
So I'm. So you mentioned Uber. So Uber, yeah. Airbnb, yeah. Netflix. It seems more and more everything I do is sending money to Silicon Valley, whereas before it might have more or less kept it in um, Canada. Even if media, you know, if the way I read the newspaper is through Facebook shares, then the advertisements are, are being sold and money's going to Silicon Valley. Are, do you have any concerns about Canadian sovereignty, you know, our ability to exercise some control over where our money is going? Because every innovation, it's not just about old versus new technology, it's also mm -hmm. about more and more, everything everything we do, money goes to the United States Actually, or yeah. Sweden if it's Spotify. That's right. I think that's a, a very good point. I was reading a, an article in The Economist the other day, and it was it particularly touched upon that that with technology and with now our products being online and services being online, it's very hard to control where the profits are being made. Um, and I think that that further emphasizes the point why innovation has to be created in Canada to kind of shift that transfer of, of funds and profits. Absolutely. I, I do think it's a concern personally. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I would say for me it's less a concern of sovereignty and more just a concern of why are Canadians feeling pressured to leave and to bring their innovation to the United States. And I think it's more about tackling that than tackling the sovereign issue of does this affect our sovereignty as a nation. Hi, sorry. My name is Luisa Melendez. I'm a second year undergraduate student in economics at McGill. And um, so actually last week I was with the International Relations Student Associations um, of McGill in New York at the UN headquarters for where, <clears throat> so ARSAM as it's called, uh, we're the only student led NGO that has <clears throat> consultative status with the UN for the Economic and Social uh, Commission. And so we are basically the only um, youth that was present there. And it was really impressive how much attention we got just by being youth. And it seems like there's been this sort of shift in general. Uh, I mean, you mentioned reverse mentorship. Um, in like listening to youth and what we have to say and there was a lot of m mentioning about youth being the present and not only the future and so like I guess my question to either one of you that would like to answer <laughs> is um, how do you feel like going into the working world perhaps maybe you to have more um, professional experience um, how do you feel that being young has actually been an advantage for you? Um, I think I think being young is definitely, it's definitely an advantage. I mean, I already feel a little bit old, um, especially in the entrepreneurship space. Um, we, bring, we bring new ideas, we bring new, we bring new perspective, and I think it's, it's people, people like us that, that are really changing the way the workplace is. I mean, I, I worked at BlackBerry uh, for a summer um, as an internship, and it was incredible how they used their interns um, to bring new ideas. So BlackBerry had 1,000 interns working there that summer. This is when BlackBerry was still cool. Um, when, when the Bolt had just come out. And, and they had a thousand interns, and these interns were leading projects. They were leading projects like BlackBerry Messenger. They were leading projects like the new design of phones. And so they were taking the youth, and they were really empowering them. And so I think you have to pick companies that, that give you that opportunity. It's interesting from a strategy view. We have Henry Mintzberg at McGill, and there's uh, Porter at Harvard, and they're kind of two different views of strategy. And Mintzberg's view of emergent strategy is saying instead of people sitting in a corner office thinking deep thoughts coming up with the answers. It may have worked 20 years ago when I was with IBM, but it doesn't work today because you need people who are in touch with the real world, with customers, with technology. Therefore, if I'm in charge, you gotta to listen to young people because they're more apt to talk to those worlds. So it's actually not only theoretically, but practically and theoretically, we should listen more if I wanna make money. If I wanna be just a hard-nosed capitalist, listen to young people, where it wasn't true 20 years ago because the world's a different place. So we see a shift there in terms of even where strategy comes from, which means youth should be listened to. The good news is I am allowed to make the decisions. As a senior person, I'm given that responsibility, but I gotta consult and listen and then I'll decide, but you guys aren't upset if I decide, typically. I mean, I think the, the world of, of the past was very, very ageist. The way we talk about racism uh, and all sorts of, of isms. Ageism is just as rampant as that. We don't let young people vote. We don't let young people drive. We, don't let, we restrict rights of young people. And I know it, it's something that we haven't accepted yet as a society, but the same way 50 years ago they didn't accept racism as an issue. So I think ageism was an issue that we are starting to conquer.
but I think it still is, it is rampant. And a lot of companies, you'll go as the intern, and you'll go, I mean, I work at a consulting group, and the, if you send a team of six and I'm the intern, my voice is just as important as the, as the partners. My ideas probably aren't as well developed because of a lack of education, but if the idea is equal, then the merit is equal and my, my voice goes through. And I think that is, we're slowly starting to crack that. There are industries that are starting to crack that, so I'm lucky to be a young person now where, that, where that's, I can ride that wave. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're um, uh, concerned about ageism, because we certainly don't want ageism. <laughs> I've got a couple of comments and, and, and then a question for, for all of you. Um, Your name and oh, just where you're from? My, my name is Ian Smiley. I'm from Ottawa. Um, a couple of jarring notes in the conversation. One was, um, you've all got big plans, but when the question of climate change comes up, it doesn't really have much to do with me. That's somebody else's problem. That's what I heard. Charity. I chair the board of two charitable organizations. Um, kind of a throwaway that charity is not a good thing. Um, maybe you're thinking of charity in a certain way, um, that it's all just handouts. But no problem in taking 80% tax credit from the government. Tax credit is a gift from the taxpayers of the province or, or, or the country. So a bit of a jar there. Um, you said that uh, Canadians are more risk averse than Americans, and I think we all know that's probably true. Um, but there was a comment about how um, we are more worried or more fearful of bankruptcy. Well, shouldn't we be worried about bankruptcy? Bankruptcy means you're not going to pay back people that you owe money to. It's a problem, and it will be a problem for you as a bankrupt, unless you're Donald Trump. It will be a problem for you as a, as a bankrupt going forward. So those are just some comments. My question, uh, the word failure only came up once. Sean, you used it once. Um, I'm interested in whether you've encountered failure, whether you've had any experience of failure yet. And I'd also like to hear some, uh, some thoughts on stress. Stress, they say, is worse for young people today than it used to be. Well, let's focus on stress. Yeah. You so, guys feel stressed? So I can talk about stress a lot. I think when you look at other student leaders, um, so we have a, every a president of every undergraduate society meets regularly, and I think those are probably the contingent of the most depressed people at McGill. And these are people with 4.0 GPAs who have a following of thousands of peers who elected them, who are elite athletes, who have all these accolades and all these resumes that you would think, well, why, why would these people have mental health issues, right? And I think stress, as I touched on with our education system, is a, it's something that is necessary because of the way we've structured our system. So I think stress is something that we are in a system that requires stress to succeed. And you cannot, you know, you can't just put in eight hours a day anymore, right? If you're putting in 15 hours a day, every single day, working for someone else, or, or not even someone else, but working for a cause you may believe in, you're going to feel stress because it, and it ties to that, to that failure issue. You feel like if I'm not putting in this time, I'm gonna run into failure. Um, and that failure draws to bankruptcy as well. I think the purpose of bankruptcy protection is to enable people to reach for the stars, and if they fall, yes, there's some, something there to catch them. And I agree that fundamentally, maybe we shouldn't be encouraging that attitude, but I think as a society, we've decided that we want people to do that. We want people to shoot for innovation, and if they are going to fall, we'll catch them because we think them taking that risk gives to our society. So that's why we've, we've developed that. So I think all, kind of all those issues are tied together. Is there a stress at medical school, Sean? So I'm in a class of people that only have 4.0s. And it's, in, it's incredible how stressed and worried people can get. Um, I would say I'm one of the exceptions, though, because I, it, it's about the mentality. So I go to class, I study hard, and I do the best I can. And I don't try to be perfect. People try to be perfect in my program, and it's just, it's not really, it's not really feasible, and it's not, it's not worthwhile for their long-term health. So what I've always tried to do is just, is, is work as hard as I can, and I know that I have limits, and I need time to relax, but I don't get stressed about things that aren't in my control. Do you stress stuff? Um, working full-time, master's degree part-time, amongst other things, it's, it's a very charged schedule, I could say. Um, I think it's about managing stress. The way that I manage stress is I go to the gym. I'm very lucky at, at Bell we have a gym in the building. 
So I will always go at lunch about four times a week. It's one hour. It's including a shower. It gives me about maximum 30 minutes, whether it's a treadmill or it's my, my personal uh, trainer in my pocket. I, for those of you that are stressed, there's nothing that releases stress like a bit of exercise and movement. Nothing. It, oh, it's the children. Or children, which oh, small I don't, children I are, very, uh, you know, are very good for stress I'm not, I'm not well. privy to that experience yet, but, yeah. but certainly. Um, it, the studies show it. A lot of executives that we've had have spoken strongly about exercise and just moving. And I physically feel the difference. My, my quick half hour, I come back as if I've chugged a gallon of coffee and I'm re-energized, I'm alert. Um, and stress is dissipated and I, I feel as though I even make better decisions. So stress is a very important point. Thank you for, for raising that. Good morning. My name is Francois La Rochelle. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. Um, my question is uh, follows uh, one comment that you made about the, the one of the challenges that you saw was the disparities uh, in Canada. And I would like to uh, hear your point of view about the um, huge sum of money that some CEOs take when they leave or sell their companies. I don't want to put you, uh, I know it's, it's on TV, so some of you that are already working, uh, I'm sure won't like to comment while your boss are, <laughs> is looking on. But um, I, think it, I think it's a question of image also of, of, of uh, the business community that is at stake here. Thank you. I mean, I can speak to this a little bit. Um, and, and touching on the, the previous point of failure, um, my, my startup did fail several times. We never went bankrupt, though, because we were very resourceful. And one of the ways that we didn't go bankrupt at one point is I cut my salary as CEO in half. Um, I, would rather have, uh, I would rather have a piece of a company that's worth something or that has the potential to still be something than to have a large piece of, of nothing. And so. I think it's important that you're invested in the business. CEOs should have um, a lot of stock options, and they should have that kind of um, that kind of uh, investment. But necessarily, in terms of salary, um, personally, I, I didn't think the high salary was was worthwhile. But if an entrepreneur walks away, like I interviewed McGill Grad, co-founder of Unicorn, if he walks away three hundred million, is that all right? If he exits, yeah. Why wouldn't that be all right? So that's different than someone who's the CEO of a big company that gets three million when he gets fired. Absolutely. Do you see that differently, those two? Yeah. I think that's what, partly what we were, the question was about. I mean, it also depends on the initial agreement. So you might not have had that person working for you if he didn't have that agreement in place in, uh, at the beginning. If it happens at the end, if he says, well, I'm leaving and I want this, I don't really agree with that. But you have to honor the initial agreement. But do you see corporate greed at the senior levels? You know, it's, it's interesting because every, I would say almost every single person outside of the business world believes CEOs are overpaid. It's kind of, that's, that's the sentiment in the world. And it's something that, you know, we talk about a lot in business schools. I know, I read a study which is a little bit related that talks about hockey teams and their argument is the most undervalued players on the hockey team are the highest paid players. Because if you look at Sidney Crosby, you cannot replace Sidney Crosby's talent with whatever he's earning, $10 million a year. You cannot replace that with 10 players earning $1 million a year. You can't, he's more, he is objectively underpaid. You look at the McGill Education. In McGill Education, we, ha we reject applicants. By the nature of us rejecting qualified applicants, our degree is, is too inexpensive because it, it is not costing the person what the value they're driving out of it is. And that's why mm -hmm. so many people want it, who are qualified for it, who can't have it. So it's, it's interesting, are these CEOs being overpaid? Sure, there are definitely cases, I think, when, when they're being overpaid. But I think it's hard to necessarily say that that um, matters because who has claim to that money otherwise? If you're exiting with $300 million, sure, we could distribute it equally amongst every single employer. That, that I would understand, but imagine how a shareholder would feel. A shareholder would feel, well, it should be distributed amongst, amongst the shareholders. So I think it's a question of no one has a better claim to that money than the person who put the uh, risk founder, in founder, like Sean, if he built his business over 20 years and he took all the risk and he maxed out his credit cards and bugged his mom and dad for money, that's different than 
I came and I worked for Air Canada for five years and I rose to a certain position. And it's been around for 100 years. So it's kind of a startup versus a, a, another company or two different things, I think. But it, it's interesting because I think what the business school, what we teach at the business school, may be different than what a fair number of Canadians think. Is that a... Let's, should we get another question over here? <laughs> sure. Thanks very much. I wanted to first just commend you on your frankness and openness in answering the questions. It's really refreshing. Uh, my name is Sharon Jeet Parmer. I'm an international human rights lawyer, but I actually also work on private sector development in um, uh, post-conflict states um, for, uh, for the for-profit sector. I had a couple of questions. I'd like to actually re-ask the climate change question uh, because I don't think you necessarily have to be a climate change expert to have a point of view and, and to contribute to the conversation. Um, I think of climate change as a collective action problem. So the bulk of carbon emissions that are generated are actually generated by less than a dozen countries in the world. And so when you think about it, in those terms, perhaps the problem isn't as monumental as you might think it might be. And I'm just curious, so I work on social transformation, you know, mobilizing um, civil society and bringing to them together with government. And I was curious whether, from your perspectives um, in the business world, what type of um, methodologies or strategies do you think from you know, what you do could be useful and applied to address this collective action problem in the context of climate change, whether that's through corporate social responsibility or, or even at a more, at a more um, basic level in terms of the strategies you use in your work um, you know, to address what I call this collective action problem. And second, um, I used to teach law at an Ivy League law school, and I was very concerned about the mental health of my students. <laughs> and and I, I appreciate that uh, you know, my generation has not been that great either about work-life balance. And what can we do to change that paradigm? Because I, I think it's not only important for you, it's, it's important for me too. <laughs> so I'd be curious to hear what you think needs to, be, to change the paradigm. Um, what can we do so that do we need to change our culture to be more like Europeans and have statutory holidays? I don't know. Uh, but your thoughts on that would be fantastic. Thank you. Let's start with the second question. I mean, I, I'd love to, I mean, I hope to be a student in Ivy League Law School and I hope to not have stress. So this is obviously something that I think about all the time. Um, I think, as I mentioned with the education system, we need really fundamental changes. Like I think, as with a lot of solutions, it's very hard to just make little, you know, add a statutory holiday, sure. I know in BC, I think when I was in grade 12, we added like three or four holidays. And sure, it's nice, but then you just add more and more time. And I think I can give a really good example. A lot of my friends worked at Goldman Sachs last summer, and they implemented a rule to help mental health where you couldn't be in the office between midnight and 6 a.m. So what happened was every single intern worked midnight, or sorry, worked 6 a.m. to midnight every single day for the whole summer because there was no way that they could differentiate themselves other than that. So if I'm someone who likes to sleep in and wants to work till 5 a.m. and then sleep until noon, I could have done that. But instead, you, you conform to that standard. And I think it's a deeply rooted issue in us feeling like we always have to beat someone else. And I know it's, uh, especially in business school, it might not be the same as, as in other faculties, but you feel like you are always out to beat somebody. And if you're not beating somebody, you're out to beat. If you're the best student, you're still trying to beat yourself. There's always something more, there's always something more. And even if you are Rhodes Scholar, full ride to Harvard, world champion, you always want to be something more. And I think it's that almost intrinsic greed to always be better that drives a lot of, a lot of that stress because we're never satisfied with, with what we have. But that drives human progress. Yeah, yes. So how do we drive human progress but calm down? It's, it's, how do you be a human being and an overachiever both. I mean, I think it depends how you define progress. Like, if you define the objective of your life as to be happy, and you see the only way to be happy is by progress, oh, that's something I believe. I believe I'm really going to be happy when I change the world. I'm not going to be happy being successful in a way that doesn't change the world. And I think that that's just the way I d my utility formula is created. That's, how, that's what makes me happy. But I think it's about, it's about changing that in people and not having that worldview. Okay. I think you have to find a way to program it in your life, in your schedule. We've had, as I said, some CEO guests, I think it was Paul Tellier, who came in and said he scheduled the time. Every day he would not miss tennis. It was at X amount of time. Every day he made a log of it. It was his habit. It was a part of his lifestyle. So. I think that's really what has to, just like me, that, that, that I, I've programmed the gym, I've scheduled it in my lunch hour, rarely will that change 
if it does change, I'll, if I get booked over lunch, I'll go in the morning, I'll accommodate because it's very important. So it's, it's something I think students have to, with such an action-packed schedule, if they don't think about it, they won't put it in. They have to make that change in their lives and get support to make that change as well. It, it is a challenge for sure. Startups are very stressful. Um, extremely stressful and I had the opportunity to build a culture the way that, that I wanted to and I put in a few things which really helped um, with the, the well-being of my employees for example I put in flex hours so you only had to be there for a couple hours a day the rest you can do on your own there was one guy he wanted to start a family so I let him start working from home um, there is a there's a trial period that doesn't work for everybody but I think there, there are certain things which you can do which allow your employees to feel like they're really in charge and, and they really feel as though um, they're valued. We really valued him, and that's why we let him do that. I, I just will move on to another question, if that's all right. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for that. Um, it was a great pleasure to listen to you guys speak, because you've obviously thought a lot about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So that was nice. Um, my name is Andrea Di Stefano. I'm the editor of uh, Miguel's academic website. Um, so I, I want to talk about value because I wasn't really satisfied with your answer about what uh, business and government can learn from each other. Um, I heard a lot of the goal of business is to make money, and that's, that's fair. Um, but I feel like in terms of, I've never worked for government, but my understanding is it's more about creating value. Um, if you don't have enough money, I guess you can just print more. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> but it's more about serving people. Uh, so, in terms of, of your business, uh, what's, what's your vision for creating, creating value and how do you plan on doing that? I mean, as someone who's never started a business, I really think the only way to make money is to create value. And I think, you know, in a lot of, uh, in a uh, hypothetical sense, we do a lot of, you know, case competitions, a lot of these strategy practices. Often something that frustrates me is the ideas people pitch don't really create any value and no one will ever want your product. And I believe the, the, what a business is in the purest sense is the right to justify the margin you're taking. And that margin is just the value you're adding. So I would say there's, there's the one sense of creating value to a consumer that I can then exploit from them to make money. And then there's another sense of, well, I've now created this margin. I've done something that no one else can do that has a value. How am I going to then let that value be maintained by me not taking all the margin into my pocket? So I think that that's where I see the, the difference. Sorry, just to follow up, uh, is there a specific value that drives your business, like, like uh, in terms of values, you know? Well, I think social it values. It, in terms of social values, so I think it de it depends on the business. I would say the values that drive a typical a non basically a non social enterprise would be. I can add value by making my pants feel silkier, so I can sell, the, I can sell those for more. So that is a, a value to everyone who purchases these pants I sell, derives value. I think we define a lot of our social values about, around things that people don't profit off of. So if I cure AIDS and, I'm, and I sell a pill that cures AIDS that's extremely expensive, I've created value for society. I've discovered the cure to AIDS. But a lot of people will see me as a bad guy by not giving this away. So I think that there's a, a perception around value that, that as well is a, is a factor there. And, and just to add on to that, um, so there, there are different ways that you can make a business. One is to make something cool um, and then sell that for money. Another is to find a problem and address that problem with a solution. So in entrepreneurship, we really try to, to find a problem and then build a solution for that. For us, it was people that have a stroke can't necessarily do their rehab. And so the way that we create value, it's really, it's really threefold. One is we increase accessibility. So a lot of people, if they've had a stroke, they can't drive to a clinic to get their rehab. Mm. They can't walk to the clinic. We let them do it from home. So we measure how many people can get rehab that couldn't before. We measure how much they save on the rehab. Because it's very expensive to get private physical therapists to come to your house. And you need six hours a day at the very beginning, which you, know, you don't get under RAMQ. The third is the adherence. So over 60% of people don't adhere to the rehab programs, even though they know that they should. And if they don't, they will not improve. They will not get better and be able to work again. And that's just because it's a very long process, and they don't see improvements very quickly. But with our system, it's fun. You see improvements on a microscopic level. Maybe um, you can't pick up that pencil, but you can rotate your arm one or two degrees more. And with technology, we can see that, and that motivates you. So those are the values that we're creating. I think we have time for, Will, one last question. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll try to make it. Yeah, it'd be a good one. Two. Okay. Two. Okay. Two. Okay. So well, we have uh, we'll, yeah. we have one one uh, more question then. So. So first of all, uh, um, I was born in the 80s, but even though I wasn't alive during the 70s, I have to agree with you, Professor Moore, that the, the music in the 70s is uh, light years ahead of anything Can we tweet that's. Uh, <laughs> that? Can someone tweet that, please? <laughs> so. Uh, I think yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, just to, to, to follow up on some cultural themes, I mean, personally speaking, I grew up watching uh, Captain Planet and Bill Nye the Science Guy. I don't know what you guys <laughs> grew up watching. Uh, and uh, another cartoon character, for example, uh, Spider-Man, comes to mind. Uh, you know, the, the, the line, that with big power comes big responsibility. And I look at you guys and, you know, I'm, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Daniel. I'm a Montreal-based lawyer. You guys are so accomplished and, uh, I mean, I'm, I was really amazed at a lot of the answers that you gave, very well thought out, uh, very, very uh, educated. Um, there's one there's one issue where I, I want to sort of like uh, focus on and and that's um, uh, well climate change and uh, uh, basically my my well first of all my, Michael I just want to just uh, address one one issue for example um, commercial airlines yeah. for example according to ICAO only contribute about three percent of global green, greenhouse gas emissions that's one, one thing but that's just one detail um, and the question is the G7 basically set a goal to um, have a carbon zero uh, economy by 2100, 2100. And that's something that even Stephen Harper uh, agreed to. So ac according to you guys, um, is this too conservative or is this like not feasible or uh, is this goal sort of doable and, and what, do you, what do you guys think about it? And also just in closing, uh, we really need people like you with the, the brightest minds of the generation to work on this issue and not to sort of uh, you know, let's say, uh, ignore it, let's say, you know. Okay. I mean, I guess I can, I, I'll be 100% forthcoming. I wish I knew more about climate change and I wish I could give a solution because it is something that I recognize, not only is there a demand for a solution, but it's regarded as something that is valuable. So it's, it's hard for me because I'm always someone who firmly believes I don't really care about people's opinions, they don't know anything about what they're talking about. And I feel someone who is unfortunately ignorant in the issue. Whether a 0% is feasible or not, I don't know. But I, I do think what I do know is setting a goal as a country and as a, as a group of entrepreneurs within a country and, and all the businesses we have to try and make progress is something valuable. So, I mean, I, I have no idea what it would take to, to make 0%. But I do think setting a, an ambitious goal that, that we will make action to change is something that, that is valuable and something that's important to me. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's very hard to answer whether or not it's, it's feasible or it's doable because I don't have that, the education to, to make that call. Um, I think that the, the conference in Paris, what I, what I heard, and it was very, very publicly uh, in the media, at least on CBC, played a lot. And I, I think that the, what was being said was that the conversations were very progressive. It was a big advancement on this subject um, and that the agreement, it appears to be feasible. I cannot comment on that um, as long as, uh, what, what's great is that it, it's a collaborative approach. There are milestones. If we could trace those milestones and meet them, that, you know, it, it's, a, it's tough to say without having the, the knowledge on it. Should we have the last card, Sean? Yeah, so just, just one small thing. Um, you're talking about 0% in, in several years. Personally, I think one of the issues with that is it's, it's very far down the line. I would like to see uh, smaller goals, um, maybe, maybe yearly, maybe monthly, maybe every six months. That's one thing I sort of learned in, in the startup world. Uh, we had an agile methodology. So we, set, we made a new product every two weeks. Every two weeks, it was a brand new product. We pushed it out to all of our customers. And that gives you time to get feedback. It gives you time to make improvements. And it, it means that you're not just going to say six years have passed, we didn't meet our goal. You'll know that much sooner. And so maybe we can't do a yearly or every six month check in um, on an international level, but perhaps every country should be doing that and reporting somehow. Um, but basically, the agile methodology is what I would push to. Yeah. One last question now. My name is Caitlin Bowman. I'm in my last semester at McGill studying industrial relations and econ. Um, I'm from the US, so my question is somewhat, I know, <laughs> after this conversation. No, we feel bad. Um, uh, one of the questions I have for everyone here is McGill pulls in Montreal in general, such a large international population. But then after university, a lot of that population, including myself, will leave and go back to their country. 
how do you think or do you think it's possible to somehow encourage recent or new university graduates to stay in Canada, specifically in Montreal? What can be done to encourage that, to keep that from going back to their other country? In the, in the MBA, and I know Sean could probably attest to it, it's all international, all. And it's, it's, there's a lot, especially in the part-time program, actually, it's, it's more Montreal focused because we're, we're working here. But we do integrate a lot with the full-timers, and the majority of them are from all over the world, which is really fascinating. And I do ask them, you know, what are your plans? You know, there was one person who worked uh, in Europe. He worked in Singapore. It was just fascinating, his background, and, and he loves Canada. The challenge that I hear over and over again for them to stay in Montreal is the language. The language is, is a very big challenge for them. French is very difficult. It is hard to find a job that will accept you if you don't at least know a bit of French, at least here. Um, so I think to keep these very valuable, educated, brilliant people with, with great experience, um, I think a lot of head offices have to come back. and. If, we, if the businesses are international, English is the language, uh, the international language. I think that that would really help them stay and also give programs, you know, to, to and I know that that exists, there's a lot of opportunities to learn the language and integrate um, to encourage them to stay in Montreal. I don't know if you guys wanna. Yeah, I mean, I, I okay, go ahead. We do need to maybe stop there, is that okay, Carl? Oh, absolutely, yeah, okay. you're the boss. Okay. Um, thank you, Carl, and thanks to the panelists for extremely uh, diverse and interesting discussion.